Today on Rambling About Cars, the sun is literally rising on the next-gen WRX from Subaru. There's a faster Porsche Cayenne. There is a crazy 27-liter V12 Crown Victoria that we're going to talk about. No, the Crown Vic isn't coming back, but one person is trying to make it bigger and better than ever. And then we are long, long overdue for a thorough rant about flying cars. So buckle up, you jamming Jetsons. It's podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith. Chris Bruce, are you ready to have this conversation? I'm very ready. I've been anxious for the flying car <laughs> uh, conversation for a while, and we've got some interesting news this week. So let's get right into yep. it. How about that? Yeah, let's jump right into it. Um, want me to start here with the WRX? If you'd like, yeah, I'll throw. I've got the photo right here. You've so got the you photo right there. So, I yeah, do. just today as we're recording, which is actually June 29th, um, we're recording one day earlier than we usually go. Uh, but Subaru dropped a teaser of the next generation WRX. Oh, it kind of makes you wish the Evo was still around, doesn't it, Bruce? I mean, we're looking at the teaser now here on YouTube. So this um, is the Brighton version that our yep. buddy Jeff Perez, he lightened it up. I'll put the dark version up in a second just so people can see. But even this lightened version for people who aren't watching on video, you're not missing much. There's not much to see here. It is a proper teaser. What we are seeing and I wrote, I actually wrote up this story mm -hmm. for us. You could convince someone this is an extensive refresh of the WRX rather than being a new WRX pretty easily, I would say. Yeah, it, just with this teaser, I mean, we're able to see just, just the top of the car. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of looks a lot like the current WRX, doesn't it? It's not, it's, it's not meaningfully different in any obvious way from what now, we can see here. Of course, I mean, the teaser, we're not seeing the entire car. We're only of seeing course. just 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 the top half, really from the belt lineup. We're not seeing the grill. We're not seeing uh, the doors. We're not seeing the wheels. Uh, but, but I mean, this is this is <laughs> this is telling because usually once the teaser campaign starts for a new vehicle, it's a matter of weeks, usually at most six weeks at most, unless unless you're Toyota, in which case you tease yeah. the super for like a year and a half. Or you're teasing the tundra for or teasing the tundra. no idea how long, but it's until gonna be somebody a leaks it and then they just give right. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean this means we're probably going to see the next generation all new Subaru WRX in a matter of weeks by yeah. the end of summer. Oh, possibly. certainly by the end of summer. I would say by September at the latest. I would bet, mm -hmm. and, and of course. Summer. And, and I mean, we, we've seen spy photos. Actually, we haven't seen a lot of spy photos. We've seen, seen a couple. Some, we've seen a uh, couple. up until up until now. And the rumor mill has been telling us um, that it's going to have the 260 horsepower engine. What is that? The Bruce, the uh, you're the Subaru guy. That is the That's FA 24. So the, the FA 24 2.4 liter turbo. Yep. Um, so the F series of engines came out with the Ascent. It was first in that. So mm -hmm. Subaru for literally decades for wow. It might be close to 30 years had their E series of engines. Yep. People probably know the EJ and things like that. Yep. And with the Ascent, they finally came out with a new fa engine family called the F, E, F, you know, makes sense. So uh, the, the FA24, so 2.4 liter turbocharged. In the Ascent, the Legacy, the Outback, it makes 260 horsepower. The scuttlebutt is in the WRX, it'll probably make a little bit more. I wouldn't be sure 300 wouldn't shock me like that seems totally reasonable. And then the, the big rumor is, is that the STI is going to get a high output version. That's going to push it to 400. Now two 400 horsepower from 2.4 liters. That's a, that, that's high strong. I'll be curious to see if that rumor proves to be true, but that, that that's what we're hearing right now. At least it is, it is a lot. Um, and it would be fantastic. It would be quite a, it would be a lot of power in something the size of a WRX. Yep. Um, and for our YouTube but, watchers, we are looking at one of the yes. spy shots we have right now. And you can see, even from the spy shot, it <laughs> looks a whole hell of a lot like the current WRX. Do it not, it really does. We're not going to get a hatchback again. We're not going to get, you know, boxy kind of fist like styling that we got mm -hmm. from the early ones. It just looks like a WRX, the current WRX, that is. And, uh, you know, hey, Props to Subaru for keeping it going. I mean, yeah. for I mean, for for well, decades uh, there was the WRX versus Evo. I mean, the uh, Mitsubishi's Rally Fighter. They had a good battle going. I think they kept each other fairly honest and they kept each other on their game. And yeah. I don't know, Bruce, with with the Evo gone, 
I mean, at least at least there's a new generation for the WRX. Yeah. Do you do you think do you think Subaru's maybe losing their way a little bit with the WRX? They're not being quite as aggressive, maybe on the style. I mean, it sounds like they could be pretty aggressive on the power if if the WRX does step up to 300. I mean, that's I mean that's STI power, right? I mean, I you're we're certainly expecting 260 because that's what every other application mm-hmm. of this engine makes, but kind of the scuttle but is is a little bit more so 300 isn't shocking but yeah it's you know ever since that kind of so it's worth noting that subaru hasn't competed in the world rally championship for quite a few years now basically right. i think it's 06 07 something like that they pulled out and so with not really having a reason to create a competition version, also not having the Evo to compete with, also Ford kind of giving up on the Focus RS and things like that, they don't really have that much reason to try as hard as they used to. And, you know, I'm a Subaru owner. I like Subarus, but that's uh, the WRX is in kind of a rough spot at the moment. And... Yeah, it 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 feels like, you know, if we had an Evo out there, if we had a Focus RS out there, if, you know, by some wish, Lancia came back and made an Integrale Delta, you know, Ooh. something like that. Like, they would have a reason to really, like, make this a super hardcore performance car. And none of those vehicles exist, so they can kind of, they don't have to try that hard. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Who is Subaru's competition right now with the WRX? I mean, you can still get a hot focus in other parts of the world that just not here in the United States, right? Sure. So, I I mean, we I guess we have to think a little bit more globally. Um, but yeah. Most or N, me? Like, if there's not a good straight-up competitor, unless I'm missing one. We All probably we are. are. We probably are, but... Well, the you know, the, the GR Yaris... I mean, but that, that's not available in the United States, it, but yeah, it's, you're it's, right. It, I mean, it's a lot smaller, mm-hmm. um, but I mean, I, I would see somebody going for our, the WRX, may, maybe choosing that as well. Sure. Um, I mean, if, if, if we get a GR rumor, Corolla in the U.S., exactly, maybe. Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. There's the ongoing rumor that, you know, Toyota couldn't get us the GR Yaris, that they're going to give us a GR Corolla. And if that's true, then yeah, that's going to be a competitor. But the issue there, then you have to consider, is that Toyota owns 25% of Subaru, and do they want to compete against themselves? Like, mm. I don't know what that relationship is like, that do they want to have two vehicles that are, you know, take stealing sales from each other? So, yeah. Well, the near future here for Subaru is going to be very interesting. Sure. Um, yeah. I love rally. I've always been a fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I remember here. going to my first stage rally in the United States here back in 2000 or 2001. Um, it was back just before you could actually get a WRX or, or an Evo in the States. So going out yeah, and seeing like some 02, of these. 03? Yeah. 02, I think, oh, is the first year oh, of the WRX. Yep, yeah, 02 was the first year for the Rex in the in the States. So yeah. going out to the stage rally and seeing some of these cars that had been imported, oh, mm-hmm. I, I was just in heaven. And I still, I'll, I'll still have an Evo 6 one day. The, the Evo 6, Tommy Mac edition. Mm. Yeah. I love it. So, Mitsubishi, if, you're, if you're listening, look at what Subaru is doing. Listen to your shareholders. That was a news art article from last week. Mitsubishi shareholders are saying, hey, Mitsubishi, we want a new Evo. And Mitsubishi says, we can't afford it. Yeah. <laughs> Which, hey, it, it's, it's true. So, we'll see what the future offers. Speaking of future... Actually, I guess it's present now. Bruce, do you want to talk to us a little bit about this crazy Porsche Cayenne that sure is, so, is an SUV that's insanely fast? I'll, I, I can. OK, you got it. To, yeah, it's right here. So this is the go. Porsche Cayenne Turbo GT, which immediately is kind of a misnomer because this model is only available in the Cayenne Coupe body style. So it should be the Cayenne Coupe Turbo GT, but Porsche's official nomenclature drops that. So. It just, it is what it is. But as you can see from the headline here, if you're watching on YouTube, 631 horsepower, that's from a four liter twin turbo V8. And it's the same block as what's in you, what you would get from a Cayenne turbo coupe, but there's a new crankshaft, new pistons, new connecting rods, new timing chain, tweaks to the turbos. Like it, 
they basically changed all the internals in order to push the power up. Um, also, you're, so it only runs through an eight-speed automatic. They added a water-cooled transfer case for the Porsche traction management system, so the differential, so water-cooled differential. Uh, it'll get to 60 in 3.1 seconds, which is just stupid quick, quarter mile in 11.6 seconds, and a top speed of 186 miles per hour. Um, so, yeah. But <laughs> I get... So I, I yeah, like, go, like go ahead. I know where I you're going. Story. I, I think you know this, the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask you, what do you think this vehicle costs? A lot. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not, it's not quite 200,000. It's not. Well, I'm, I'm, well, I'm sure you could option it up to that. Yeah. So starting price on this thing is a $180,800 plus a $1,1350 destination fee. So $182,000, let's yep. call it. That and that's is and that, that that's a base price and we know how much Porsche loves to just toss in anything that they can put in there as options. Oh, you want door handles? That's a five hundred dollar. Okay, it's not quite that bad, but you know what I mean. They yeah, for a hundred eighty thousand dollar vehicle, you would expect to have just about everything you could get on there. And when Porsche says this is the base model, yeah, it'll be the base model. You'll have to go in and and you could add probably. I mean, we haven't. There isn't a configurator up yet, right? No, no. So this is going to come to the United States in late fall. Okay. So, or no, I'm sorry, in early 2022. I. Uh, I got that messed up. It'll come okay. to the US in early 2022. It doesn't it doesn't matter because I mean we're not going to be able to afford it anytime soon, probably never. And I owe be... less on my house than this car costs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I mean, hey, welcome welcome to 2021 where the average new car price is 40 grand. Yeah. And it's, uh, and it's... I mean we keep seeing high-end vehicles like this that are I, I mean once upon a time you could get a supercar that was really expensive, but it was a niche vehicle. I mean, this, I mean, it's it's a Porsche Turbo GT, but it has functionality. I mean, it has room for five people. Four and people. Cargo. No, no, no. Just oh, it's, oh, it's, it's only four people? Yeah, so I, oh, they I got, got buckets. The, the oh, they got the seat. buckets in the back. Yeah, yep, you cannot get this in a five-seater. So this is pure four-seater. Uh, you could shove somebody in the middle there. It's not recommended. It wouldn't be legal, but. Right, but you could do it. You're right. Okay, yeah, but yeah, four, it's four, just, comfortable four-seater with with room for a lot of stuff. Yeah. It, zero to 16, 3.1 seconds. I know people are buying these because automakers, the, the high end brands, they keep coming out with new models. So, I mean, they wouldn't be doing that if people weren't buying them, but yeah. man, that's a, I mean, that's a lot of money and maybe it's, Maybe I am being unfair. You know, your 911 turbos, your GT2 RSs, those are going to cost, you know, a fully optioned 911 Turbo S isn't going to, is going to be as much or maybe a little bit more than this. It's just weird to think of an SUV, a crossover that is a, the performance version and is knocking on $200,000. And I mean, I don't see somebody saying, well, I could have this or the 911 Turbo S. Sure. I mean, you, it's two completely different genres. So, I mean, who's who's deciding? Well, I want to spend 200 grand on this family vehicle. And the other I, thing, I, is, I guess, is, it's a person that could also then turn around and spend another 200 grand on their 911 Turbo S. Yeah. So they could have their matching Porsches in their garage. And yeah, that's just a that's just a completely different class of of person that. Uh, that I don't we are know. Not. Yeah, <laughs> but it, <laughs> we are so not. I, I'm just picking nits here. Like this is just. A th but you look at this, and I don't see anything special about the way it looks for it. Like for a two hundred thousand dollar vehicle, it looks like a Porsche Cayenne coupe with mm -hmm. some cool wheels and a cool body kit. Like you look at a nine eleven turbo, or you look at especially like a GT two or GT three RS or something like that, and they've got the huge aggressive wings and like you can kind of see it on them and for better or worse, this is very understated and I can see some people wanting that understated look. And I can see other people looking at this and being like, well, I, no one can tell I spent $200,000 <laughs> on this. It looks like a Cayenne turbo, like or Cayenne it's, turbo coupe. You're right. It's certainly two different approaches. Um, I mean, I, if I have a nice car, 
I guess I would want people to know just how nice it is. Um, I don't know what kind of a person that makes me. I know. Okay, here's a good example. Back when I had my 1987 Mercury Sable LS station wagon that had the show swap in it with the with the show V6 engine and the five speed. Um, when I got the car, I mean, the previous owner had just kept the absolute sleeper look. Um, he even it had dual exhaust underneath, but he even had he went so far to have the second exhaust pipe mounted, you know, curved out the side. So it looked like the standard exhaust pipe on the other side. So if you're oh, looking wow. at it That's, side on, okay. yeah. it still looked just like a normal sable. And I got the car and I mean, I did a little bit of restoration on it. But one of the reasons I sold it was just like, I enjoy driving it. But you know what? I guess I'm vain because I also enjoyed some of the attention that you get when you're driving mm -hmm. a cool car. And nobody even looked at that thing. <laughs> even after I put some nice wheels on it and I had the windows tinted, um, it was a white car with completely black windows on both sides. Um, I mean, I'd get a thumbs up every now and again. But for the most part, it's just like, dude, you, you're driving a 30 year old Sable. So, I mean, there, there, there is something to be said when you spend that kind of money. And, you know? So the more you, I think about it, I wonder if I'm being unfair. I wonder if it's just that this is a vehicle that doesn't appeal to me that I cannot imagine. Like I could see doing, uh, you know, a Panamera wagon, you know, loaded up or something like that. Maybe not for 200,000, but. I guess I, I wonder if it's the fact that the vehicle isn't doing anything for me that I'm trying to criticize it in some way, but I don't know. Like I, I mean, I'm a Porsche fan. I, you know, but this one, it's just, it's weird to me somehow. I don't, maybe someone will comment and have a really good argument for or against it or can explain kind of why I'm having these mis misgivings. So I hope someone does. Well, I mean, let me ask the question and I'll ask the question to everybody listening out there too. Um, send your answers to podcast at motor one.com or drop them in comments on the article or at YouTube. You have $200,000 and you want to get a vehicle that can carry at least four people and stuff with some functionality, but you still want it to be just absurdly fast and well, kind I'm of fun an to RS drive. Six and saving what 40 grand, something like that. So, so you go with an RS six. Yeah. So, so you would leave the SUV realm altogether. That's, I mean, that's not a bad choice. I mean, will anybody it's still 120 be, be, grand, but man, the well, RS six just does everything. Will you, be, I'm with you there. I love that thing. And I hate big grills and I still love that thing. That's how amazing it is. Um, and I guess that's another point. Is anybody going to take their Cayenne coupe off road? I mean, it's not, well, this isn't a, it's, it's got a lower suspension, even compared to the, the Cayenne turbo coupe. So this is not an off roader. It's not meant for that. So like, why, I mean, why would somebody, cause it's still going to have a higher center of gravity. I mean, it has suspension to, I, it's a good question. Why would somebody go with this over say the, uh, the, the, the sport Turismo, you know? Yeah, I, I don't, I, you know, Porsche is going to sell these. I, I, I don't, I'm not criticizing Porsche as like some sort of business fashion. Like they're going to find buyers from the, for these, it just doesn't do anything for me. Um, for anyone watching on YouTube, here is the latest RS6. And uh, yeah, it's, um, he, it, it just, it just, oh my God, it just looks so mean. It's And low, as reference, so the one that we sinister. have here is $120,000. So it is not an inexpensive vehicle, but I'll save and, 60 grand and take one of these. <laughs> and you can fit five people in there. You can. Yeah. You can get five people in there. There's still lots of stuff in the back. Yeah. I mean, that's. But it's yeah. a station wagon, Bruce. Station wagons haven't been cool for 20, 30 years. They well, they, they weren't even cool back when they were everywhere. That's why they became uncool because they were everywhere. And then they this became is a station wagon with kind of 591 cool. horsepower and all wheel yeah, drive. I, I, it, I know preaching to the choir, it's my friend. Slower than the Porsche. The por the Audi gets to 60 in 3.5 seconds versus 3.1 seconds for the Porsche. Am I ever gonna notice that four tenths of a second? Nope. No, nope. and I, I'm going to feel better driving that Audi. Um, yeah, I mean, good question, folks. And seriously, send us some comments. Yeah. $200,000. You need a family friendly vehicle that still has gobs of performance, some exclusivity, 
what are you buying? Are you buying this Porsche? Or are you going to be like Bruce and me and grab that Audi instead? Or is there something else? Maybe, maybe you go for the sport Turismo. Maybe you, maybe you keep it there. What's a, what's a Lamborghini Urus go for? They're, they're over 200, aren't they? Uh, probably. I want to, they're right in there. I will pull up our, uh, I mean, not, not that I would go for that, but I mean, if you, if you're seeking a little bit more attention in your SUV, that's probably going to get it for you. So, yeah. So in our review of the 2019 Euros, it starts at 200. So if you're spent, if you got 180 to spend, you got 200 to spend. You, you got 200 to spend. So yeah, let us know what you would get there. Bruce, I want to kind of change things up a little bit. I'm going to yeah. share something. Um, this is actually an article you wrote, but it certainly caught my attention. And it caught the attention of a lot of MotorOne.com readers. Yep. Because this thing has just been killing it for us traffic wise. It's this a Ford a Crown Victoria with a freaking 27 liter V12 tank engine in it. Come on, take a this look at that. This was a fun story to write simply because I like writing stuff like this because I get to delve into like history. So I read all about this V12. So it is a Rolls Royce Meteor V12. Yes. Um, and it's, it it's is based on the on the Merlin though. It the, is based the on the Merlin. Merlin. Yep. Okay. So it, it is not supercharged. While there were unsupercharged versions of the Merlin, most a lot of them were. This one was specifically built not to be supercharged, and it had to run on what was called pool gas, P O O L. So it was basically mm -hmm. just the any type of the gasoline that they had available. Whereas the Merlin ran on Av gas, which is always yeah. much higher octane. So and if you're putting this in a car, which of course <laughs> somebody's going to put it in a car, right? It's right. a little bit easier to keep it fueled. Tell us a little bit more about this thing, because uh, I mean, we're, if if you're not on YouTube, just picture a late model Crown Victoria with no fenders, no hood, and a massive tank engine with probably an intercooler the size of like it's a two story two house gigantic intercoolers. So um, <laughs> if you can click on the video and go to the very end, they do have a picture with the front end in place. Um, it's like very, very, very end. They do a little even farther than that. Mm, it's not going to load for me. Everybody's okay. looking at this video right now. Um, but anyway, um, it, it's going to be right in there. But um, yeah, they there, these, there we go crazy people in there somewhere in Europe. Um, I apologize. I don't know where, but they got a hold of this, you know, from the Ford, it, it served in the British military from the forties to the mid ish sixties. There you go. There's the one with the fascia in place. So look at that thing. Um, and it's just wild. Insane. Um, and you're going to see something as this uh, for anyone watching. So they added a twin turbo setup that was not stock and they are massive turbos. They would like <laughs> eat up small like squirrels and bunny rabbits and chipmunks. Um, if you were going down the road, they're claiming what the goal is. So in the video that we are watching now is just a test. The turbos, the boost pipes were not engaged. So they were just kind of running the engine. Everything's there, but it's not but actually. It, but it working. did run. It yeah, did it, run. We want to be yeah. clear on that. Yep, it did run. It's just that the turbos weren't added to it. The goal is to make 2,500 horsepower and 3,806 <laughs> pound-feet of torque. Perfect um, for pulling... Any, literally anything. You know, if your neighbor needs help relocating their yeah. five-acre estate, just chain it up. Yeah, you got it. Uh, and this is from an engine that originally made around 600 in the early applications. And by the 1960s, applications were making around 800 horsepower, which is still nothing to laugh at. Like, But with the twin turbos, it's making a ton more than that. Um, and yeah, but when you look at it, when you see like the firewall and stuff, I'm curious to follow this because there's no way they're going to be able to keep the front doors the way they are. Because once you add a firewall over the engine, essentially when you open the front door, there's going to be about this much space because it's, it's going to have to be firewall because of how far <laughs> yeah. back the engine has to sit because <laughs> it's a 27 liter V12. Um, well, I mean, so, I got the video paused here where we're looking at the bracing inside. It, I mean, is it the angle of the camera? Because it looks like the bracing goes where a person would sit. 
Right. So, but yeah, look where the transmit, look where the bell housing and stuff is and look where the door is. That's like yep. a third back from the door is just where the transmission bell housing is. So they got, it, it's going to be interesting to see how they shove a person into this. They, they got some fabrication work but, ahead of them, but God but bless God them for speed, getting, man, getting like, this far. Yeah. Holy cow. We salute you. An and awesome I gotta say, it's epic been, use of a P seventy one Crown Vic, and here yeah. I thought it might be neat to get one, and uh, and do like a, a nice Terminator swap with the with the three hundred ninety horse four six V eight, you know, like it should have been back when they did the Mercury Marauder. Now twenty seven liter tank engine. V12. And, so, and I gotta complain a second. So on Facebook, there were there were quite a few, not quite a few. There were a handful of people saying that a Tesla Model S Plaid would leave it in its dust. Oh, and maybe the it Tesla would, fanboys. But you're missing the point. Like it's a, sure anything, but just the fabrication to get a 27 liter World War II era V12 into a panther platform ford and to get it to go and to get it to run like that's the point it's not how fast it goes it's just the engineering and the fabrication and just everything that and the makes it so cool and hey all you tesla people let me tell you something top fuel dragsters will just wipe your tesla off the face of the planet that's how fast a top fuel dragster is the point of the uh the story here there will always be somebody faster sure Tesla, they're good. They're not the end all be all, but for God's sakes, you're going to compare a Model S plaid to this completely customized fabricated vehicle where you will never, ever find anything else in the world like it. Come on, people, get real. Be realistic here. Agreed. Be realistic. Do we got some time to talk about campers? Yeah, I think we got I think a little bit quick. of time. Yeah, we got to do it. Do it. We, we got a little bit of time here. Let me, uh, let me share this image because we've learned over the past couple of years that motor one readers they absolutely love campers mm -hmm. so we've been trying to do as many camper stories as we can this one just came out here um what was it yesterday on monday Jeez, and right? killing it and killing it in traffic right now we're gonna share this right here on uh if you're watching on youtube it's a small teardrop camper trailer. It's brand new. It's a single axle. It looks absolutely tiny, but it literally expands to become three times its size. Right. Um, it's, it's from a company in France, and Bruce and I, we, we were, were talking about this <laughs> pronunciation. Forgive us, dumb Americans. Is that Bauer? Bauer? Error? B Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? It's, it's B-E-A-U-E-R. Um, and this is a brand new offering from them. It's just, it's called the three X camper trailer. And I mean, we're looking at it now. I, I mean, that's something small enough to be towed behind a compact SUV. Yeah. And it's it very is small. It's being towed behind. I think it's an X three in this, in the images that we're um, looking at. Uh, it weighs just under 2,100 pounds, mm -hmm. which I mean, that's, that's easily in the realm of a lot of vehicles for towing. And at the push of a button, it expands into a 129 square foot four person camper. Um, let me see if I could bring up some images here really quick of the inside. Well, I, it, and what's neat about it is you push a button, it all goes um, mechanically, you know, it, it's all ele uh, electrically powered. And the seats, everything as it expands, they automatically fold down and snap into position. Mm -hmm. And it's got a full kitchen, it's got a bathroom, it's got everything in there. Um, and I mean, I think this, I mean, this is just, just amazingly slick to me. We've seen plenty of pop out campers, especially like the big motor homes, big RVs that have sections of the side that'll slide out, but a small little teardrop like this. Yeah. That I've never seen that before. It, 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 I mean, it literally, the whole thing expands to the left, to the right. Yep. And you just, you kind of get this little dome living space. Um, I don't know. I don't think this is going to be available in the United States. I doubt but that, it. I, but, but that looks you know. supremely, I mean, for, for a small camper that expands like that, that looks extremely cozy and comfortable. Um, I also looked up on their website. We'll have links in the article. Um, this is a little single axle trailer. They're mm -hmm. making a larger double axle that also oh, expands out. 
Okay. And I mean, that ends up looking like a, like a small motor home or, or like a, like a, almost like a double wide trailer. It's, it's incredibly roomy inside. And I think another thing that's worth mentioning is that for the three X for the single axle one, it starts at 29,900 euros, which is about $35,000 us. And if anyone has gone camper shopping, that's kind of a bargain. Like that's on the lower end, certainly of what you could spend. I mean, you can spend hundreds oh, of thousands. You can easily, but- you can easily get up there, especially, I mean, if you get some of the nicer, like some of the Airstream trailers um, and looking at this on the inside, it looks, it has kind of a retro look on the outside yeah. inside. It just, I mean, it's it looks very ultra European modern. modern. Yeah. We're looking at a photo now um, kind of facing the kitchen where you've got the stove, uh, you've got the sink there. And then because of its slide out nature, the bedroom, and I mean, it's it's like it creates its own little room. It's mm-hmm. not just you put up a curtain. I mean, there's there's a divider there with a door and uh, you have your own little private room. It's a, a very little cool small trailer. Idea. Yeah. yeah. Very cool idea. You know, we we try to post a uh, camper content a few times a week. Usually um, it always does good traffic wise. The van life movement has just been coming on strong in the throughout the last, oh gosh, I mean, almost a decade. I mean, I can I can vaguely remember back in the 80s when conversion vans were kind of cool and mm-hmm. then they just kind of went away. And now, I mean, it's gone beyond conversion vans. I mean, these are there are so many companies making full on mini motorhomes um, and we try to cover what we can. Small stuff, large stuff. Um, there was an article I wrote last week on a do-it-yourselfer that built basically a small home. They actually got rid of their home. They live in this Ram Promaster cargo van. It's a Ram Promaster 3500 cargo van that they built and converted into their own little tiny home on wheels. And it's them. It's the it's the two of them and two dogs. And I tell you what. It's, it's probably the coziest, well done, do it yourself camper I've ever seen. I couldn't, I mean, I have too much stuff. I mean, for God's sakes, look in my room behind me here, my <laughs> office. I have way too much stuff to ever do that. But I, I really envy the people that can just kind of break themselves down to the bare minimums, just get out on the road, enjoy life. Um, we'll put a link to that article in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in our article when it goes up on Friday at motor one.com. Yeah, so you can I, see that. I mean, that's that article went up for us last week and it's still pulling oh. decent traffic. So, I mean, there are, there are people out there that are really, really fascinated with the idea of just kind of ditching the normal life, moving into a nice van, heading out that's on the not road for me, man. I live, I, I I'm still a youngish guy and I still have a lot of memories of living in dorm rooms at apartments and things like that. And I finally have my first house and I've lived here for a few years and it, it would take something serious for me to go back to that tiny living lifestyle. I I'm, I mean, I could, I, I appreciate I it, it, but it's not for me. I could do it for a nice vacation, yeah. But I, but yeah. I, but I couldn't do it permanently. Exactly. And and to the credit of the people that build this van, I mean, they're they're a young couple. Um, I, I've looked them up on Instagram. I think if I remember correctly, they're fairly recently married, and the, their motivation was, hey, you know, we want to get out. We travel a lot, anyways. Um, their occupations are such that they can do their work on the road, and their their reasoning behind it was, hey. We'll stick with this until we're just kind of done with it. And then we'll go back to a house. So bravo, bravo yeah, to anybody on. that can, that can take that step. Bruce, yeah. are we ready to move on here? D- did we have yeah. any comments that, that we, we wanted did. to talk we about? We did. So uh, folks, I got to tell you, we only received comments this week on YouTube for whatever reason. You didn't email us podcast at motor one.com. Email us. You people. On, yeah. You didn't comment on the post at mo- motor one.com. We had, but um, we had se- we had over seven thousand views on YouTube, which was just a phenomenal performance. So we appreciate yeah, everybody that, checking in for on us. That. But yeah, but if you're watching it, come on, get us some feedback, talk with us, chat with us. We're rambling about cars. Come on and ramble with us. We yep. but we we did it. We did have some good comments though on YouTube. 
We did. We, yeah. So um, this one comes from Rob and he says, boy, I'm really loving this show. It actually Thank reminds you. me of going to a car show. Um, I went to a car show in Dover, Ohio. I'm familiar with Dover a few years ago, and I couldn't believe the cool stuff that came out. There was a classic th- Mercedes 300 SL. I'm convinced some of the best car shows are found in small rural towns. Uh, check mm-hmm. out some of the crazy car shows that happen around Highlands, North Carolina, surrounded by some of the best driving roads in the U.S. Us. Um, and I responded to him on YouTube and yeah, he's right. But the cool cars exist everywhere. That's kind of the, the, it's not a hidden secret or anything like that, but you don't necessarily think about it. I live in a smallish town. You live in a smallish city as mm-hmm. things go, but yeah, when uh, we have an annual car show on main street here every year, and just the coolest stuff comes out. There's a guy with a Citroen 2 CV who I've never oh, actually really? seen on the road, <laughs> but he's always there. There's a guy with a DeLorean who I see every summer, but he's got a bike rack on it. And it's not hooked up. It's not like on a. a, a Are you sure that's a like... bike rack and not a flux capacitor? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I've seen the bike on it. It's angled on the rear deck. And so, you know, if you take, you've seen like bike racks where you can take the front of the wheel off and you can set it down there. And I've seen him rolling around with his bike on the back. Like, Bravo. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, I caught that comment too. And I dropped in a a response a little bit late with, with you totally on the whole smaller town thing. When I moved out here to South Dakota, the last thing I expected was to find the rich car culture that I found out here. Honestly, probably the coolest Volkswagens that I've ever seen, including some rare models, have been out here hmm. in, in the land that I figured, OK, this is just Harleys and trucks out here. There are a lot of Harleys. There are a lot of trucks. But there's such a, an amazing mix. Rapid City hosts its own downtown car show every summer mm-hmm. that usually pulls in about 250, 300 or so cars. Um, you know, pretty good. A lot of classic muscle, a lot of classic cars, a lot of modern cars. A few imports, uh, but there's a car club out here. The Counts Car Club is is their name. They put on a car show in February. Now think about that: a car yeah. show South in, February, in February in South Dakota. I mean, uh, how many days last year did we have well below zero? I mean, sometimes we'll have many days that it actually gets above freezing. We're in kind of a, a strange area here, but still. They put on a car show in February. It's indoors at the local civic center in Rapid okay, City. Okay, that makes it work. Um, but they get like Autorama, like former Riddler Award winners. Which, if you're anybody that's familiar with Autorama, it, it's probably the premier custom car show in the world. If you win a Riddler Award at Autorama, yeah, that's a big you're, deal. You're, you're you're instantly a superstar in the builder world. So here we are in South Dakota, almost to Wyoming in February, and I'm walking around the Civic Center in Rapid City, South Dakota, looking at these phenomenally built custom cars. And we're talking everything from like some of the local drifters with just crazy modified Hyundais to some of these former Riddler Award winners. And I, I never would have expected that in, in a town like this is like 70,000 people. That's not a small town, but mm-hmm. I mean, it's certainly a small city, but once you get outside of town, there's nothing, there's nothing but fields. So yeah, man, thanks for putting that comment in there and reminding us big or small car shows are amazing. You will always be surprised when you go to a car show, get out to them. If you have something even moderately cool, or it doesn't even have to be cool. It's something that you're really proud of. Join up. Get into the car show. So Odds are you're going to find somebody that is into the same thing you are into, and that makes it all worth it. So while you were talking about that, I went through my old photos, and I found the DeLorean with the bike rack. So oh, if anyone boy. doesn't believe me that exists, I gotta see this. if you are watching on YouTube right now, you need to go to you YouTube can Motor One Podcast. DeLorean, look on the back on the rear deck. He's got a bike I- mounted on there. I don't know, man. I, I think the bike is disguising the Mr. Fusion, to be honest. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. I I never would have expected to see that. I've never I, seen I mean, another I mean, one who, like that. I mean, who, who throws a bike rack on their DeLorean? Just, yeah. Ah, I, I, hey, I want to go out to the trails. Let's, let's not take the truck. Let's take the DeLorean, man. 
So I'm all yeah. I'm all about that. Very cool. Well, there's another reason you should follow us on YouTube to see some of the crazy yeah. stuff we're talking about. Speaking of crazy. <laughs> I, OK, I, you know what? I need to take a drink before we go any further here. Ah. <sighs> So this is a debate that it's, you it's and time. I have, this is a, so, okay. I'm trying to think how to do this. So you and I have had a series on this show called what were they thinking? Um, and we, it's something we revisit every once in a while. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases in on this, it is going to be an example of what were we thinking because we are guilty of this as well. And we should really probably change our behavior in the future. And what I'm talking about with this is the term flying car. Mm. So it, when I was in college, I took a few linguistics courses because I had two for my German major. And so there's this idea of prescriptive versus descriptive language. Prescriptive language or linguistics is like a word has to mean this specific thing. You are prescribing a meaning to it. Descriptive is much more kind of ad hoc that as things evolve, it, the word kind of describes what it is. But to me, a flying car has a very specific meaning. That being, it is a car, i.e. a thing on the ground that you can drive that can also fly. Somehow within the past, it's recent, five to seven years, the definition of that word has changed. And we're seeing flying car being related to things that, to me, are not flying cars. They're aircraft. In many cases, they're rotorcraft, and that's fine. But we can't keep calling them flying cars. Let me let me bring up an image to kind of talk to to kind of explain this a little bit here, please. Um, um, it was I think back in 2020, Hyundai unveiled uh, something that, that they're calling their flying taxi. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean it's just a concept, but I'm I'm, I'm going to share this image here right now for everybody. Um, oh wait, no, I'm sorry. Oh my gosh. That's a that's a Bell V twenty two Osprey um, tilt rotor attack aircraft that's used by numerous armed forces, including the United States Marines and the United States Army. I, I apologize, folks. That's here. Here's that, people that, getting that's, on that's, it. That's, see, that's okay, that's how you get on. No, no, wait, no, 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 Bruce. That's also <laughs> sorry. That's also the Bell Boeing V twenty two Osprey tilt rotor aircraft. Um, honestly, I mean, I can see why people make the mistake. Um, I can see why people make the mistake and possibly I can see where Hyundai got their inspiration from. And to be fair, we should um, show the, Oh, you've got it up. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got okay. it right here. Yeah. This is, this is their air taxi, their concept. Yep. Um, which I mean, I hate to break it to you, Hyundai, but you're a little late on this one. That's not um, a flying car. That's that, not that's, a car in any sense. That's not a car. That's a tilt rotor aircraft. Um, and, and I mean, propellers have been driving, air vehicles for over a hundred years. So, yep. I mean, the, the, it's not really a new concept. Um, and to, th to this, was, folks, this was, this is what kind of Hyundai is thinking. This is what their airport they is going to look like. And you can see one taking off here. You can see some in the background. And the idea is that it, it is supposed to be for short flight, i.e. what helicopters do now, where yeah. <laughs> they could come like pick you up and then take you to the airport or take you to a destination Hold on, Bruce. nearby. Hold on. Hold on. I, I see where they're going with this. Imagine if if this concept could be refined, especially in, in crowded cities where these these aircraft, if you will, or sorry, these flying cars could actually we'll say land on rooftops. Sure. Yeah. How what I, would I that mean, look I, like? Oh my gosh, think of the application for hospitals. Instead of ambulances on the road, they could have a little pad. No, hear me out here. Yeah. Because, I mean, this is, a, this is a money maker. They could have a little pad with one of these vehicles that can land directly at the hospital to bring in patients that are in critical need of care. It, that's, that's a, why is, haven't is they it, thought of that yet? I can't believe nobody. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait. Okay. No, I'm, I'm wrong on that. Everybody. I apologize. That's actually been around for decades and decades and decades. So, oh, we're not breaking any new ground there. Bruce, uh, sarcasm aside here, um, Mr. Bruce has spoken very eloquently. I'm just going to say, get over your damn flying cars already because they're bloody stupid. They're, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's not going to happen. 
it's never going to happen. If no. it, And hear me out. Never. It will never happen. Definition notwithstanding. We I, have to explain why. And you and I are both, to be clear, neither you or I have pilot's licenses. However, I almost, you and I, are I almost both, had one. How close did you get? Um, I got, I was eight hours into, oh, Jesus, my, into you were my close. Flight time. I finished, I finished ground school. Oh, wow. um, that was okay. back in high school. I finished ground school and I was eight hours into flight time. Um, just shy of my first solo in a Cessna 150. And I was in high school and I had one instance where I was a little nauseous in the plane. Mm. And I think I use it as an excuse to say, Oh, I just can't afford it anymore. Mm. And I feel bad. I, I should have stuck with it. I will get my pilot's license one of these days, but yeah. Never going to happen. Why? Go ahead, Bruce. Tell us why. So the very simple reason is that if something happens to you and your car on the ground, you can pull over. Even if right. we're talking about autonomous vehicles, like we talk about, you know, something happening. A lot of even current autonomous vehicles are smart enough that if something t t inexplicable goes wrong that like they detect that you are incapacitated somehow if there's some mechanical fault with some of the sensors or something like that they can pull over to the side of the road and stop if you stop flying you fall to the ground and die this is and, true um and, and that and, is a major issue you are never going to autonomous <laughs> flight is a serious <laughs> enough issue because you are deal dealing with three dimensions and all of the weather and wind that goes with that even some of these flying cars that we're calling them, you have to be licensed, you have to be trained, and you have to be healthy and competent enough to control them. And that's why so few of us, including Smith and I, do not have pilot's licenses because that process is incredibly expensive, even for a very basic private pilot's um, license, not talking about multiple engines, rotorcraft, like helicopters, things like that. A lot of people don't realize you, once you get a pilot's license, it's not like you can fly anything. Like I can't <laughs> go get in a Boeing 737 and fly it once I just get my basic pilot's license. There are different, um, oh, what do they call them? Um, there are basically there, there are different certifications. Um, that, yeah, there are different certifications like, oh, you want to be able to land a tail craft like your your World War II plane. That's a certification. That, you want to be able to fly very differently on the ground. Yeah. Yes. A helicopter. That's a different certification. Helicopters Every are actually extraordinarily difficult yes. to to learn. Um, yes. Just because for a regular pilot in a fixed wing aircraft, um, you're used to the controls. Helicopter, it's actually the, the controls are quite different with the collective affecting your altitude. It, it's click, yeah. it, it's it's a it's a completely different a uh, different way to fly. Um, I haven't I haven't looked at the various classifications recently. I think you can get a recreational pilot's license. It's not it's not extremely expensive, but you're extremely restricted on what you can do. There are some things I, I like. I think ultralights. Might Ultralights are actually category, pretty easy, although where, that's... where you you don't even I don't even think you have to have a, a specific certification. But obviously, you're not going to fly your ultralight into an airport of any size. No, um, and even a private pilot with a regular private pilot's license, um, say, you're not going to jump into your Cessna 172 and fly into O'Hare. You're going to be prohibited <laughs> from that airspace. Right. Um. And and yeah, like like Bruce said, in a car, okay. Um, you have a minor fender bender, you pull over and uh, and you get it all sorted out. You have a minor fender bender in a flying car, you fall out of the sky and die. Um, you and have so, you have a slight engine miss and you're losing a little bit of power on your car. You pull over to the side of the road and you call AAA or your road service. Uh, if you have a slight miss in your in your rotor or aircraft, you fall out of the sky and you die. I mean, okay, I know you can auto rotate coming down on some of those fixed wings. Like lives. The point point is, think about all of the accidents you hear about every single day with vehicles on the road. Granted, there are far more cars on the road than there are aircraft in the sky. But the reason you don't hear about all of these accidents happening in an aircraft is because you go through gobs and gobs and gobs more training, more experience. 
because and you just don't more fall. maintenance. There is required maintenance on an aircraft that All every these- whatever hundred thousand miles, whatever it is, on a specific engine on a specific aircraft, it must be gone through and have a complete overhaul. Not only that, Bruce. Um, I mean, even for just a basic private pilot. I mean, when I was when I was taking my lessons, uh, you have your pre-flight check. Mm-hmm. You you go around, you spend 15 minutes or so going around the aircraft, you're checking the control services, you're checking the fuel. How how often do you spend 15 minutes going around your car to check it out before you jump in it and go? And to it's go just, back go back to and, this flying car thing. And I yeah. want to be very, very clear. I am not so th- this was written by one of our coworker, Jacob Olivia. And I am not calling him out because I will show stories that I have written and that you have right. written that have called these flying cars. This is just an issue of nomenclature and wording. But the thing that we are looking at now, which is what two fours, eight rotors, and this is it, from this is the air speeder that's going to be racing at some point, but it's called a flying car. This is not a car it's, in it's, any way. It's not a car. It's it's design. Um, it's design kind of borrows from styling of race cars i think in yeah, the 50s it, and it's 60s. formula one-esque maybe but that doesn't so, make I mean, it. It, ha- it has that s- kind of sleek look but you know what else has a sleek look a p51 mustang yeah <laughs> and that's not a flying car that's a freaking awesome aircraft um yeah that's that you're not driving that i the question becomes okay what is the definition of a car and you describe that has a vehicle on wheels that you drive on the ground you could say car is is just a derivative of automobile, which I guess if you want to break it down, automobile, moving by yourself. Self-driving vehicle, sure. But. So, I mean, I mean, you can stretch it there. But over time, we know automobile and car, it, that is synonymous with something that drives on the ground. So, I mean... I'm I'm not really that interested in splitting hairs there. I don't care if I don't care really about the definition. The just the practicality will never be there. We already have these small vehicles that can transport people and land pretty much anywhere. They're called helicopters. And now we're getting more into quadcopters um and, and multiple rotor aircraft like that. Those aren't cars though, right? Now <laughs> Bruce Bruce has a, an article that I wrote uh what was it probably a year ago or so switchblade flying car now this October is actually yeah this is actually a car it's it's it has wheels it, it drives yet. it drives down the road it doesn't fly <laughs> i remember when they made this announcement it's like yeah we're doing high speed trials and it goes down the runway at 88 miles an hour oh so it's gonna time travel then going back <laughs> to your delorean um but yeah it, it's how many how many flying car projects have we heard about in, in the last so several many. years where uh it's 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 either not doing one or the other in this case we have the car part but it's not flying now to be fair i haven't followed up on that since we wrote that story at the same token switchblade hasn't been anywhere on our news radar so you know that could be a, a little telling right there right so i will say as impractical as it is is a flying car possible yes i would argue that it is so there's a company called aeromobile um it is from slovakia we are looking at it on youtube now and you can see it is it looks car ish you might not want to drive it very far but you can see there are folding wings there is a propeller in the back. Um, the story we're looking at is from 2014. Uh, this falls into the definition. But if you want to understand the challenges of combining both a car and a plane, if on its maiden journey, it crashed. <laughs> and so we, <laughs> we will be looking at this now. Uh, yep, that's, a, that's embarrassing. Flight, and you can see. Oh, that's not going to buff out, was it? Hopefully everybody was okay on that. I believe they it I believe it crashed on landing. Yeah. The the pilot opened his parachute and was transported to the hospital but suffered minor injuries. So pilot fine. Well, well, that's 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 good to hear. And this raises another quandary when you talk about a flying car. The aero properties that make airplanes work really good, you generally don't find on cars, and the aero properties that make cars work really good on the ground. 
don't generally translate well to aircraft. So it, it's a difficult, it's a difficult balance to find, at least with our current technology. You know what? Maybe once we get to the Jetsons era where we have maglev or anti-gravity or whatever, maybe things can be a, a little bit different there. But still, if that anti-grav generator fails, you <laughs> fall out of the sky and die. Let me share one, uh, um, a flying car that's actually, actually much more recent. Um, this kind of slipped past me. Our, our former colleague, Matt, who has since moved on um, to, to do some bigger and better things. So uh, popular mechanic. I, 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 I think he I think he went over to popular mechanics. He got his start with us and it was a pleasure yeah, no. working with him. That's a great guy. Um, he he put this this uh this article out. We're looking at it right now here on YouTube. And it's the Klein Vision flying car. Uh did it have a specific name? Let me look at my notes here. Um it was just called the air car, the Klein Vision Air Car, but it actually flies and drives. Um, we're going to take a look at it here now on YouTube. Um, I mean, you can see it going down the runway there. It, it actually looks fairly well car sized. And yeah. prior to takeoff, it's got twin tails that that extend back for better stability. That's... The wings fold out. It's all done with the push of a button. You don't have to get out. You don't have to move things around manually. Um, I still hope you'd go through the pre-flight because, yeah, if you, if you find there's a little bit of a fuel leak, you're not going to pull over and wait for somebody to pick you up. You're going to fall out of the sky and die. So and you just wonder about the compromises because yeah, it looks like an okay car and yeah, it looks like an okay plane and it could fly, but it, yeah, I mean, the looks I mean, we're of it, it doesn't right appear now. to do either one spectacularly well. That, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious as to how it drives because I yeah. mean, it, it looks like it almost has kind of a, a, a supercar presence about it. It's it's low. It's kind of mm -hmm. wide. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we, we see it here on YouTube. It's it's got some altitude. It's not like it's just kind of, you know, spruce goosing it 10 no, feet off the ground. Thousands of feet. I, I mean, it's I mean, it's it's being flown up in the air. Um, yeah. But but yeah, again, with, with an aircraft, I mean, that's that's an extremely wide aircraft for its wings. I mean, I, I almost wonder if they have some engineering underneath going on to help with the airflow there. And another thing, I mean, you have four big wheels and tires at each corner. There's a reason why a lot of aircraft have retractable landing gear. You get a lot of drag from those wheels. But again, we're seeing it land. It's now landed. It's back on the ground. And its its rear haunches are opening up. The wings are going to fold up and fold in. The tail folds in, and it looks like it wouldn't be a bear to drive on the road. I mean, but this this uh, this article was November November twenty twenty. Um, I I'm this. I mean this this is kind of the dream right here. It's still not going to be. I have this car in my garage. I just go out, push a button, I take off, and I go to the store. You still have to have a runway. That's but, the thing. That's the thing I wanted to mention is that the kind of the dream of the flying car is that, oh, my God, I'm stuck in a traffic jam. I'm moving half an up. You yep. know, I'm just crawling along. I'm going to press a button. I'm going to fly up all over this traffic and go. Right. We just That's... saw that vehicle and other vehicles. They require a runway. They are a plane and a car together. And th that dream of just like. Oh, everybody else is stuck in a traffic jam. I'm going to, you know, just fly over them all. It's not realistic. It's the, not going to happen. The, the, the difference there, though, um, provided that vehicle can get all of its certifications met. Mm -hmm. If you are a private pilot, there is an extraordinary convenience of sure. being able to drive your airplane to the airport. Yeah, you don't have to rent hangar you, space. You fold it out. Yeah. You spend five minutes doing your pre-flight. You take off. You're gone. I mean, I remember being back in Michigan with a friend of mine who did finish his pilot's license in high school like I should have done. Uh, we made a couple trips from Kalamazoo back up to where our families were in northern Michigan. And like with a holiday weekend coming up where you know traffic is just going to be a bear we would just jump in a Cessna 172 that we could rent uh, through Western or no, it wasn't Western. It was a, um, it was a company over there at, at the Kalamazoo airport. Mm -hmm. um, rent a, rent a Cessna 172, take off an hour later, we land. 
But if we could have a car instead of doing that rental, we just drive to the airport. We drive out on the runway. We take off. We do the trip. We land at the little tiny airports up in northern lower Michigan where, I mean, there are all kinds of little airports. Yep. Fold up the wings and then just drive to where we would want to go. And that's, I see tremendous appeal in that, but that's going to be for a very, very small, small group segment. Of people. Yeah. Because, I mean, what, and again, a lot of people don't, I think, understand just what it takes to get a pilot's license. And rightfully so, because, you ha- you can get your pilot's license for a single engine propeller aircraft, light aircraft. It's not terribly difficult. But now what happens if it gets cloudy out? You need to be <laughs> instrument certified because if you can't see in your aircraft. Was it not more than on- three miles, I believe. Not, not only. BFR, not, IFR. Right. Not only is it just kind of spooky because you can't see. It's completely disorienting. I've been in that situation a couple times. Oh, okay. Thankfully, I, I mean, I was, I was just along for the ride. Um, I remember at one point we were actually flying uh, from Western Michigan to the north. Uh, my friend wasn't IFR certified yet. We had we had minimums leaving Kalamazoo and it was clear up north. So the plan was we'll stick with the minimums. We'll fly over to the lakeshore to Lake Michigan. We can stay low and follow the lakeshore and be sure we're safe from power lines and everything along the lakeshore until we get up where it's clearer. So we book it over to the lake shore and we were still at minimums and we just started to head out over to the lake. And there was a moment for probably about 10 seconds before we made our right turn to follow the lake shore, the horizon and the lake completely blended. So all we can see out in front of us is a single shade of light gray. And once that happened, vertigo, I mean, it was legit. Mm-hmm. We were, I mean, we were, we didn't panic, but it was just, a, it was a completely foreign, scary feeling, not being able to orient ourselves visually. All of a sudden we couldn't tell, are we diving? Are we climbing? So you've got to look down and you've got to trust the instruments. Right. And that's and, why when they're training you in IFR, which means yeah. instrument flight rules, they basically put you in a hood, a hood. where yep. literally all you can see are the instruments. And that's what you are flying by. And and that's and what you are flying by. You and have if you to think- trust that. And that's what the training is, is that you are just in this hood and you have to trust mm-hmm. it. But it is, as you were saying, it is a very vertigo inducing experience to look mm-hmm. out and not be able to tell whether you're going up and going or going down and just simply have to trust instruments. And if you think it's a little spooky, say, getting caught out in a hard rainstorm while you're driving at night or, or caught in fog add a third dimension to that and not having any sort of, of reference, you can't feel the road beneath you because there is nothing beneath you. And if you, if you just get a little bit of an updraft or a downdraft, all of a sudden you're going to feel yourself sinking or climbing. And without the visual of reference, you need to, you need to go through some serious training just to fly in various weather conditions. Right. That's we're not even talking about more complicated aircraft with bigger engines, with retractable landing gear, with twin uh, engines. That's the thing. Twin engines. Yeah. When you get a private, you can fly one engine. You can fly a Cessna or a Piper maybe, or something like that. But if you want to fly two engines, that's another certification. So imagine, (laughs) imagine having your driver's license and you can go and you can drive a Civic, a, a, a Honda Civic. Yeah, there you go. You can drive yeah. a Honda Civic. Um, but if you want to upgrade to a Chevy Suburban, yeah, no, nope, you have to go and get additional licensing for that. You have to go get additional training for that. Yeah, it's that's why you're never going to see everyday flying cars. And yeah. and to the, to the credit of of some of these uh, automakers, I, I'm going to share uh, another thing here. This is this is from Audi. Uh, back from 2018. I, I haven't heard the latest from Audi on this. Um, there's this whole idea of kind of personal mobility and autonomy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you're not going to have to worry about getting your pilot's license because the machine is going to be doing the flying for you. 
Um, cars and, can't even fly for, or you know, and, cars can't even drive. Cars, for cars us can't yet. even drive yet. Well, and that's well, two he, dimensions. Well, a lot of a lot of people will point to aircraft and say, "Well, aircraft have autopilot." Well, yeah, um, but you're also not operating aircraft within. 10 feet of other aircraft right. you should never ever be that close <laughs> and oh by the way yeah autopilot works autopilot will stabilize the aircraft it'll it'll put you on a specific course heading it'll keep your wings level it'll keep your speed set but you still need a pilot in there to turn the dials to hit the buttons to tell the aircraft okay we need to turn to 270 270 degrees west we need to tell the aircraft to descend at 500 feet per minute. You still need to have a person in there plugging that information in. The aircraft isn't making that decision automatically. Now, I, I think some of the later ones, um, there is a little bit of that in there. But when you say autopilot, it's not really just you push a button and the plane just does it all. I mean, you still have to have somebody um, controlling things in there. Now, this 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 Audi concept, this I actually find this interesting because it's a car. It, it's a small electric autonomous car that can drive people around, but then it connects to basically a large quadcopter mm -hmm. that can, that can pick it up and fly it around to different places. So, I mean, it's, it's not really a flying taxi. It's a, it's a car that can be loaded onto an airplane <laughs> or in this case, a, a rotor aircraft and delivered somewhere else in the city. Um, and, and the idea is everything is autonomous. Um, I am even not that idea. I, I wonder about, you know, we, a lot of, it, there's a lot of discussion these days about green vehicles or, you know, d d saving energy and lifting one car and one person lifting that into the air is an immense amount of energy. Mm -hmm. Like planes, just a normal plane drinks a ton of fuel. And so I, I just wonder about, how sustainable an idea like that really is. Well, that I, I th the reason I we that know... you are in a Boeing 777 or whatever with a ton of people is because it's far more efficient to put 300 people on an aircraft than to put mm -hmm. one on an aircraft. You're absolutely right there. And I, I think we kind of answered the question on that automatically because is any of this being implemented yet? Has anything that we've talked about here with the Hyundai uh, with Audi and any of that, that automated personal mobility flying stuff, has any of that been implemented? No, no, because you're going to run into a complete brick wall of regulations. We've been talking about how hard it is to fly. We haven't even talked about the various regulations that are in place to make sure aircraft don't crash into one another both when they're on the ground and in the sky, people look up and think, oh, there's all kinds of room. You'd be surprised how quickly things can get crowded in the sky with all the aircraft that are flying around. And mm -hmm. you don't have yellow markings on roads. You don't have signs telling you where to go. You have to have some direction. You have to have your air traffic controllers that are monitoring the situation where if you are flying at 10,000 feet and you want to go down to 8,000 feet, you don't, you can't necessarily see 50 miles away mm -hmm. what might be coming in the other direction at 8,000 feet. You go down to 8,000 feet, especially if there are some clouds in the area. Yeah, it, it can get crowded in a hurry. So, yeah. I mean, we had, didn't even touch on all the regulations. I mean, gosh, when I was, when I was taking uh, my private pilot ground school, that was actually back when there were still like, like ARCAs and TERSAs. What is it? airport service areas and, and, and everything has changed now. It, it's, it's, it's class one, class two, various classes of airspace where That's you have altitude those, restrictions. Yeah. Um, and God help you. If you happen to fly into a military operations area, <laughs> That's, I'm just flying my, my, my nice flying car. And all of a sudden an F 16 showed up out of nowhere. What's going on. So yeah, the rules, the regulations, the safety, the complexity, just forget it, folks. Until yeah, I we think find we have some made sort the of argument well enough that the flying car is I'm not gonna say never going to happen because never is a long time, but it's, but these, it's these, not gonna happen in my lifetime. These no it no, it won't. These grand these grand automaker plans of 
autonomous flying vehicles that'll shuttle people around the city. There's no way in hell I'm getting in one of those. Yeah. The last, I mean, the last thing I want is just an automated machine where nobody's checking it regularly. I mean, seriously, after, before and after every single flight in the smallest aircraft, you do your pre-flight check, you do your post-flight check. Mm -hmm. So you mean to tell me that um, an automated taxi service run by a company that's obviously first and foremost out to make money, they're going to be having somebody constantly checking those aircraft before and after each specific flight? No. Nope. And I yeah. wouldn't touch it. No, I, I think we've made this argument. This is an argument I, I that think you so. and I have had with uh, our boss, John Neff, before, because he is of the opinion that, you know, these flying cars that they can happen at some point, And you and I and our team's chat have basically been like, no, nope, it's not. Nope. The technology is so far advanced, so much further down the line than even well, what's available today that we know about that. I, mean, I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's an issue of technology. I mean, we have helicopters right now. You can make yeah. a small quadcopter that can carry a person and land in their backyard. Sure. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the safety issue. Yeah. People don't understand the inherent risks that you just don't even think twice about when you're in a car. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. You're in your car. The check engine light comes on. The engine's starting to cut out. Oh, okay. Darn it. Yeah. I got to call the, get, AAA. Get, on, get on the phone and call somebody. That happens in an aircraft. If you're in a fixed wing aircraft, pray that you are, because at least then you can try to look around, find a place wide enough, open enough. Right. where you can glide in for a landing. Mm -hmm. If you're in a helicopter, hopefully you can you're in auto a position rotate, you, you can you can auto rotate down but that's still yeah. that that's that's a far more difficult maneuver than just gliding in a fixed wing mm -hmm. aircraft. Yep. If you're in a quadcopter, hopefully you pull the, the emergency parachute that hopefully is on board. <laughs> yeah. Cuz otherwise you're just going to plummet and die. And yeah. yeah. That's I mean that's the hang up. The safety, the safety and the security. It's just it's it's never going to be there. Yeah. What do you well, think, folks? Podcast at motor1.com. Yeah, I want to get some do you, emails. Do you have this a case? Week. I, I, you, I would, yeah, I would like to get some emails on this. So, podcast at motor1.com. We love your comments on YouTube. Feel free to go ahead and comment keep there. But keep yeah. going, comment on the article, send us yeah. emails. But flying mm -hmm. cars, that's that's going to be the discussion. We send us some information because we'll bring this up next week. Sure. I'm curious. I'm curious if Bruce and I are just, just weird nuts. Well, I, I know that. But <laughs> I'm curious if our opinions on this are kind of in line with most of you out there. And I think they are, but I want to hear about it. Yep. I, I do and not if, send us the old uh, David Letterman, Kevin Smith video, the flying car, which every time I say <laughs> it, I think of that too. And it's funny, but you don't have to send it to me because I've already know it. So we're good there. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'll back you up on that. So let us know. Flying cars, man. Come on. Yep. Unless right. something radically changes, it's just not it's going to have to be seriously. But yeah. Um, but as always, good afternoon or good evening or good night. Whenever you happen to be listening to us, we appreciate you and we appreciate you listening. Um, like Smith was just saying, podcast at motorone.com is the email address. Motor One Podcast is the um, YouTube address now where you can find all of our episodes. Um, of course, we're yeah, also on Spotify. Yes, we are. we're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, all that stuff. Google and Podcast, um, Odyssey, I think, is another one that we're on. It's a ton of stuff. It's some I've never even heard of. But yeah. yeah if, if you have a, a platform where you listen to podcasts, we're probably there. Yeah. And if we're not, email would, us and yeah, we'll get on there. Because I would be shocked. Um, but yeah, um, but yeah, we love reading your comments. We've been doing pretty good these past this past month or month or so that either Smith or I or both of us respond to every comment that we get. So yeah, we love getting them. But yeah. we love hearing from you. Exactly. So thanks everybody and good night. Bye bye. See ya.